So our next speaker is Christina Oxfam from JPL. Christina is part of Timex. She's a brilliant system at JPL. She's very busy, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that uh, she took the week to uh, work with us on uh, these very innovative missions. And uh, Christina is going to talk about the you know, state of, of the art in small uh, spacecraft, spacecraft systems uh, that could be used for uh, these new missions. All right, thanks, Julie. So I want to start out with this awesome slide that comes from Thomas, uh, Dr. Thomas Rebukin's keynote address at this small satellite conference this year. Um, so this is a diagram of all of the small sat missions that NASA is either currently flying or planning to fly. Um, and this, you know, you can see that this, these, are, these are real science missions that are covering not just Earth science, but heliophysics, astrophysics, and planetary science as we start to take our first steps with small satellites beyond low Earth orbit. So uh, this image, I think, really drives home that uh, small sats are no longer just kind of tech demos or for the hobbyists and the universities. They're uh, really introducing a new paradigm in the way that we approach science missions. They open doors for low-cost, quick turnaround missions that focus on high-priority science questions or group together in a constellation um, with larger elements can do science that's not efficient or even possible with a single spacecraft. So that context, my talk today will really be a sort of high level overview of what's currently possible with small spacecraft with a focus on applications beyond low Earth orbit or LEO. So I'll first cover some uh, general specifications and resources. Then I'll go into some specific subsystem capabilities, uh, go into um, the current missions and those that are planned for the near future, and end with some of my personal predictions for the long term. So when we talk about small sats, what do we really mean? Uh, what is the dividing line between small and large? So there are many ways to draw that line. And one, I think, is a shift in launch cost by hitching a ride with a primary spacecraft as a secondary ride share, secondary payload. So as I'll talk about in a second, there are many secondary ride share opportunities for spacecraft up to 300 kilograms to low Earth orbit and beyond. Um, and additionally, for constellations, you can have cost-efficient distributed systems um, by fitting many spacecraft into a single launch. So another way to draw that line between large and small is a shift in risk tolerance. So small sats are characterized by um, shorter development times, reduced testing, and the use of lots of commercial and often lower TRL parts. So all of these things serve to reduce your mission cost, and then you couple that with your reduction in launch cost, and you can tolerate a higher risk because there's just not as much money at stake. And then beyond that, uh, you can work in your redundancy by just having multiple copies of the same spacecraft um, take advantage of those learning curves for constellations. And then finally, another dividing line between large and small is simply a mass cutoff. So for uh, the NASA space, uh, Small Spacecraft Technology Program sets that cutoff at 180 kilograms. And that's the convention that I'll keep following in this talk. Um, but I would say that that mass cutoff is really sort of um, representative of the other paradigm shifts that I was talking about. Um, and for secondary rideshare opportunities, again, the, the mass that these kinds of um, secondaries can have is growing. So in a way, small sets are getting bigger. <laughs> um, so within the small sat uh, categorization, there's two kind of subcategorizations. You have CubeSats. Um, and they're have, they follow a very specific form factor. So you hear talk about U's, a U being a 10 centimeter uh, cube. Um, and that form factor is limited by the commercial deployers that are available. Um, so they're typically limited by volume rather than mass because they have that specific form factor. And there's a huge commercial ecosystem out there um, available for, for CubeSat parts. So there's lots of plug and play parts. Um, but those parts are typically um, not really characterized for long duration, duration missions with um, high radiation doses. So they're good for sort of high risk, um, uh, low classified missions. So if we're talking about NASA classifications, we're looking at lower than class D. So then there's the other category, which is sort of everything else. <laughs> so there's no set form factor, just the traditional volume envelope that's set by your launch opportunity. Um, so these can be either limited by mass or volume. Um, and they can you can start to work in more traditional space qualified components with longer lifetimes. But of course, you're subject to the traditional mass, volume, and cost constraints if they fit. 
So now I'll talk a bit more detail on the launch opportunities that are available for small sats. And again, there are many launch opportunities to Leo, but I'm focusing a little bit more on beyond Leo. So one way is to hitch a ride again with a primary spacecraft like a ComSat uh, to geostationary uh, orbit or the geostationary transfer orbit GTO. So Spaceflight Inc. is one of the biggest names in rideshare brokers. So what that means is they will organize a ride for you on a number of different launch vehicles. Um, they typically use what's called an ESPA ring as an adapter. That's the ELV secondary payload adapter. So I will say I probably throw out lots of acronyms and jargons. If, if there's anything that I say that's not defined and you want to know what it is, just let me know. I'm a JPL or so I'm sure I'll use lots of acronyms that I didn't define. Um, so, the, so this spaceflight uses this ESPA ring convention. You can see sort of a diagram here. It's got all of these different ports around it where you can connect spacecraft of different sizer, sizes. So um, you can see some CubeSats kind of in the middle here. And then there's some larger spacecraft uh, that take up one single port. And Spaceflight is uh, advertising that um, one port spacecraft could be up to 300 kilograms. And when I'm saying ESPA class spacecraft throughout this talk, I'm talking about a spacecraft that goes on one of those ports. Um, so there's also uh, Space Systems Laboratory, a CompSat manufacturer that um, advertises they have six to eight launches per year to GEO that could accommodate secondary payloads. Um, they use their own pod system, and that can accommodate spacecraft up to 150 kilograms. So once you get to GEO, um, if you are going somewhere else from there, you either carry your own propellant to kick you into deep space, or some of these commercial companies like Spaceflight have their own commercial kick stages that you can use. So um, and that requires a lot of propellant. So another way um, to get to anywhere else you're going in the solar system is to hitch a ride with an interplanetary mission. Um, so that. Obviously, those are fewer and far between compared to LEO launches. So that's sort of like a, an opportunity. If you see an interplanetary mission that's coming up, you want to be able to get a payload onto that. Um, and so also, of course, if it's a constellation or if it's number of small spacecraft with a mothership, then you can have a primary launch and fit all of those into one launch vehicle. So in this paradigm, the constraints are mission specific. It really depends on the primary um, payload or the primary spacecraft that's going on the launch vehicle and the launch vehicle itself. Um, the lowest cost option to separate the small spacecraft from the primary vehicle is to still use a commercial adapter for CubeSats. So that, again, limits you to that CubeSat form factor. So now I'll go into some performance envelopes, um, starting with mass and volume. And so these stats are based on basically commercially available spacecraft buses. So the ranges that I'm showing here aren't hard limits on either the minimum or the maximum side. Um, but going beyond these limits significantly um, would cause you to customize and kind of redesign your spacecraft, and that increases the cost. So there's a lot of data on these slides, but I'm just going to focus on the 6U and the ESPA um, classes, for example. So 6U, again, being six of those 10 centimeter cubes that I was talking about before. Um, so a 6U spacecraft is typically about 14 kilograms. Um, again, CubeSats are limited by volume rather than mass. So um, it's really what's set by the commercial deployer that you're using. And you can often get a waiver if you're going to fill your CubeSat with lead to have a heavier CubeSat. Um, of that 14 kilograms, um, typically about 6 kilograms is available for the payload. Um, that's about 3U. And then for an ESPA, that's, again, I'm limiting here to 180 kilograms. There's a huge range in payload masses that are available. Um, it's typically about half the total mass. Um, but one of the key points that I really want to make here is that your payload mass and volume can always be traded for your spacecraft capability, but you can't have it all. So what that means is you can't use your biggest and best reaction wheels for attitude control. You can't fill your CubeSat with propellant, and you can't carry a high-performance you know, high performance instrument. So you got to kind of pick and choose between those and make that trade. Um, so a lot of the big ranges that you're seeing here, particularly in the ranges for the payload mass available on ESPA, is a representation of that trade being made. So now for power, um, the amount of power available is highly dependent on whether or not the spacecraft has deployable arrays. So many of these spacecraft now use MMA's Hawk arrays. For 6U CubeSat, those can get up to 100 watts in LEO. Of course, you have to scale that to whatever your destination is. Um, 
The on-orbit average payload power is about 25 watts, um, which with eclipses in LEO, that's, you know, your average is about half of your total. So this is suggesting that about half of the total power could go to the payload. For ESPA, typical is about 500 watts, but the power available is, again, substantially dependent on the deployable arrays that you're using and te technology for fitting those deployable arrays into smaller, smaller, smaller packages is always getting more efficient. OK, so data rates from LEO, again, um, from 6Us are 2 megabits per second. Um, but this number is really growing, and we're already seeing missions that are getting up to 100 megabits per second. And then beyond that, optical communications are starting to come online in the future, and those data rates could get up to gigabits per second. So this is really a rapidly growing field. Um, but again, these are LEO data rates, so you've got to scale them to wherever you're going. Um, data volume is also growing. It's typically not too much of a concern. But a key message here is, again, that CubeSat avionics are typically single string, meaning they're not single fault tolerant, um, not redundant, and not characterized for high radiation doses or long duration missions. So finally, um, pointing and propulsion. So these delta Vs that I'm showing here aren't limits. Um, certainly, there are now 6U propulsion systems that can get considerably higher delta Vs, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But again, you can fill your entire CubeSat with propellant and blast it into deep space, but it's just going to be space junk when it gets there. So this kind of gives an idea of, with a typical science payload, what kind of delta Vs you could achieve. Um, so the same goes for reaction wheels, star trackers. You can get um, bigger reaction wheels, but you don't have a lot of space for what you have. So for a 6U, that translates to a pointing accuracy, which is a combination of your control and your knowledge to about a degree, getting 40 meters per second delta V. For an ESPA class, you can get up to get down to 0 0.005 degree pointing accuracy and get delta Vs greater than a kilometer per second. So before I wrap up this section, I just want to touch on reliability and cost. Because there's this perception that CubeSats are unreliable, they fail all the time, they're not really good for science mission platforms. But a more careful analysis of the data was done by Professor Michael Swartwout at Stanford. And he looked at CubeSats, CubeSats that were launched from 2000 to 2015 and um, categorized them by builder. So we have the hobbyists. These are your sort of first timers, your universities that are just starting to dip their toes into the CubeSat world. Then you have your small satters who build a lot of spacecraft, but they only build small sats. Then you have your traditionalists. These are your NASA's and Lockheed's who are really used to building larger spacecraft. Um, and they're also uh, starting to build small spacecraft as well. But they have a very strict set of design principles that they've, um, they've come up with for larger spacecraft. So um, what you have here is in green is full mission success. And yellow is partial mission success. But that includes spacecraft that are still operating. So it means they haven't finished their mission. It doesn't necessarily mean they failed halfway through their mission. Uh, and certainly, if you don't make this division between your builder, you can see that almost anywhere between 40 to 50% of CubeSats fail. So that doesn't look very good. But if you instead look at the traditionalists, um, that number drops down rapidly to less than 20%. And that's because these uh, companies, they're using the same design principles that they have for larger missions and applying those to these small sets. That means mission assurance. That means testing campaigns. That means time and money. So um, yeah, uh, so it really, um, so the cost of the spacecraft that's advertised is really just kind of a small fraction of the total mission cost. You can certainly have reliable CubeSats for science missions, but you have to account for all of the testing that's going to go into that. So a uh, rule of thumb that I typically use for larger missions is that half the money flies and half doesn't. So the hardware cost you're advertised um, combined with your payload cost is about half of your total mission cost, and the rest goes into mission assurance, testing, ground systems, navigation, et cetera. For smaller missions, um, the hardware costs are cheaper, but some of the other things like ground system doesn't scale. Um, so that fraction ends up getting a little bit worse. It could be anywhere down to a third of your total mission cost just for hardware and then two thirds for everything else. So now I'll switch gears a bit and dive into some specific subsystems, uh, namely the Attitude Control and Determination Systems, ACDS, um, Propulsion, and Telecom. And this will be more focused on the technologies and vendors that are available. 
So um, starting with um, HCDS, um, for CubeSats, uh, Blue Canyon is, Technologies is really the market and integrated system. So that's BCT. Um, so the BCT Exact integrated system advertises that it can treat 0 0.003 degrees pointing accuracy in two axes. It can fit in half U, um, and it's been used on missions like Asteria and Marco. Um, so the parts inside include uh, 0.015 uh, newton meter second, or three of those reaction wheels, and a star tracker. Um, and for our ESPA class spacecraft, BCT continues to make reaction wheels that go up to about eight newton meter seconds. And from there, you can pick up with Honeywell reaction wheels at 12 newton meter seconds, Honeywell being one of the leading providers in reaction wheels that are used all the time on large missions. Um, so however, these images, I kind of made them roughly to scale. So on the left, you have an entire integrated uh, ACDS system for a CubeSat. And on the right, you have a single reaction wheel of which you would need at least three or more for redundancy, plus all of your other actuators and sensors. So there's kind of a miniaturization gap in this field now. Um, you can have space qualified, reliable wheels on an ESPA class, but they're really big, they're really power hungry, and so that ends up being one of the major drivers and the resources that we have for ESPA class missions. So propulsion now, um, the propulsion systems out there can be um, broken down to about four categories. We have chemical, cold gas, electric, and sort of everything else, of which the number one thing right now is solar sails. So chemical systems, particularly with hydrazine, are used all the time in large missions. Um, and one mission, sort of tiny attitude control thruster, can be a main engine on a smaller mission. Um, so they've got good specific impulse. They've got high thrust. Um, but the major problem is, is that hydrazine is really unpleasant to work with. So um, it's toxic. It's got high vapor pressures. And it's basically a no-go for a lot of secondary rideshare opportunities. So there are a lot of um, companies now that are developing sort of green propellant systems. These are using different kinds of propellant that are non-toxic, lower vapor pressures. Um, and those are in development, but kind of just on the horizon. So for instance, VACO is developing a system for the Lunar Flashlight mission. Uh, it's an upcoming 6U mission that's, uh, they're advertising that they can get almost 240 meters per second for that CubeSat. But that propulsion system takes up half the CubeSat. Um, so next you have cold gas systems, which are one of the most commonly used um, CubeSat propulsion systems. That's because they're compact and they're simple, but they have much lower ISPs compared to chemical systems. Um, so they're good for CubeSats and for attitude control on larger spacecraft, but nothing with high delta V applications. Next you have electric, um, and there are some really mature technologies um, in electric propulsion systems that are used on larger missions, but the miniaturization of those technologies is still in work. But this is a really active field of development, so I would say those technologies are really just on the horizon. Um, so for instance, uh, phase four is developing this plasma system, and they're advertising that they can get 160 meters per second delta V for a 12 kilogram CubeSat. So these are really good for high delta V applications um, or long duration maneuvers, like long duration uh, station keeping, um, but not for any sort of quick impulses. Um, so then we have solar sails. Uh, again, this is a propellant list system, which is really attractive for CubeSats where they can't fill with a lot of propellant. Um, so these work much like a wind sail on Earth, except the wind is solar radiation pressure. Um, it's very low thrust, so you need a really big sail in order to be able to have any th appreciable thrust. Um, but these can fold up very compactly for a CubeSat. So the deployment of these has been demonstrated on CubeSats, but um, they haven't been used for propulsion yet. Um, but that's about to change on some of the upcoming missions that I'll talk about in a bit. But note that these typically still need propellants or other propulsion systems for steering. So finally, um, communications. So there are three main components of a communication system. It's the transponder, the amplifier, and the antenna. And there are many commercial companies that are developing comm components for CubeSats and LEO. But for applications beyond the reach of GPS, uh, where you need to know um, where your spacecraft is, um, and you need to do ranging with the deep space network, the DSN, the iris transponder is really the name of the game here. Um, 
So it's X-band, it's DSN compatible, um, it's combined with an amplifier and it fits in a half U and it's being used on um, missions like Marco and a number of the future interplanetary missions that we'll talk about in a bit. So the, really the other option is the small deep space transponder. Um, this is flown on everything, the Mars rovers, Dawn, uh, et cetera, but these two pictures are roughly to scale. Um, the SDST doesn't come with an amplifier, so you can see there's a pretty big difference in size. Um, there's also a big difference in power if you're going to couple the SDST with a high, um, a high power amplifier. So for LEO applications, um, many CubeSats can get away with just little patch antennas, but when you get beyond LEO, um, you start to look for high gains. Um, and of course, you want to be able to have a big high gain, but it needs to fold up into a small package. So there's a number of deployable high gains um, that are on the market now. We have the reflect array antenna um, that's been used on Marco and Isara. So this is a flat antenna that folds up flat. Um, the Marco one is going to achieve eight kilobits per second from Mars um, in X-band, and the Asara one in LEO is getting 100 megabits per second in KA. There's also the option for parabolic antennas, like the half meter deployable K-band antenna that's flying in rain cube now. OK, so now for the fun part, a uh, cursory look at all the cool stuff that's happening now and happening in the near future. So uh, you've heard me talk about Marco a number of times already. Um, how else could I <laughs> talk about CubeSats without talking about Marco? Um, it's, two cubes, uh, it's, it's Mars Cube 1, two CubeSats that were launched with the InSight Mars lander from Vandenberg this past May. I don't know if you got a chance to watch the launch. I watched it from my roof. It was awesome. Um, so what you're seeing here is a picture of let's, the Earth and the Moon taken with a CubeSat. <laughs> it's just really amazing how far this field has come. So they're the first interplanetary CubeSats. Um, they package a reflector ray antenna, the iris radio, and 30 meters per second delta V into a 6U form factor. And its goal is to monitor InSight's landing and act as a communications relay. It can uh, simultaneously transmit and receive data, which means that um, it'll work. It'll get the data back faster than the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, so these little guys have really made huge strides in the field of CubeSats already. So I'm very excited to see what happens on November 26th. So Hayabusa 2 is still kind of fresh in the new cycle. Um, so this is a mission to uh, return a sample from the asteroid Ryugu. And it recently, at the end of last month, successfully deployed three tiny rovers. So the tiniest were only a kilogram. Um, but they carried cameras, thermometers, um, accelerometers, and they were solar powered. The bigger one um, was battery powered. It was equipped with a camera, an IR spectrometer, a magnetometer, and a radiometer. And it landed once, and then it bounced to another spot during its 16-hour duration. So I mean, these rovers aren't really spacecraft, per se. They're not full-up spacecraft. But I think they're still an awesome example of what can be done in a tiny package. Um, so it's kind of like thinking outside the box by thinking inside a smaller box. Um, Okay, for now the so now to talk about the missions that are on the horizon. So there are a lot. The first uncrewed flight of the SLS, our new mega launch vehicle, is planned for mid-2020 now, I think it is. Um, it'll carry 13 secondary payloads to deep space, 10 of which are shown here, and the other three of which are reserved for non-government organizations. So I could be here all day talking about these missions further, but I'm just going to select a few ones to give some brief details about. So Neo Scout um, is a JPL mission to observe an asteroid. Uh, it fly by an image a small near-Earth asteroid, that's the Nia, observing its shape, orbital characteristics, and surface properties. And its goal is really to gather information and fill in some knowledge gaps that will aid in future human exploration missions. So this is a 6U CubeSat, and its primary propulsion is an 85 square meter solar sail. Another one of the EM-1 secondaries is BioSentinel out of NASA Ames. So this is a 6U CubeSat to study the <laughs> growth and metabolic activity of organisms in deep space over an 18-month mission lifetime. And what's cool about it is actually the first kind of this study to study biological radiation effects beyond LEO in 40 years. So that will be a cool one. 
Then we've got uh, Luna HMAP coming out of ASU. So this is going to do low altitude flybys of the lunar south pole to look for hydrogen deposits. And it's got a low thrust ion propulsion system for orbit insertion. Then we have Equilis out of JAXA, um, which is going to fly to the Earth moon Lagrange point um, to image Earth's plasmosphere and measure dust environment in this lunar region. And it's going to demonstrate um, trajectory guidance, navigation, and control techniques for small sat Lagrange points. <coughs> so, moving on from the EM ones, <laughs> so I know we've got Chalazio here. Um, there are other opportunities put out by NASA for small sats. Um, and CubeSat missions, and one of them is the Small Explorer Opportunity, or SMEX. One of the missions being proposed to SMEX is Sunrise, the Sun Radio Interferometer Space Experiment. So this uh, mission would send six 6U CubeSats in a constellation brought to a uh, near geo with a rideshare on a ComSat. The CubeSats would formation fly to form a 10 kilometer synthetic aperture interferometer, and they would observe solar radio bursts that can't be observed from the ground. They can only be observed in space due to ionic absorption. So there's also the um, Planetary Science Deep Space Small Sat Studies, PSDS3, um, which gave teams funding to develop small sat mission concepts. The goal of really just seeing what kinds of things could be done with small sats so NASA could continue to formulate their strategy. Uh, so there were 19 studies awarded, and they covered concepts going to Venus, the Moon, asteroids, Mars, Jupiter, and Uranus. So I'm just calling out two here that involved multiple CubeSats. Um, there's the uh, ROS, formerly known as Caesars. So that's another mission called Caesars that changed the name. Um, it's a dozen 12U CubeSats that would each be sent to a different uh, near-Earth asteroid. And then there's also the BiSat observations of the lunar atmosphere above swirls, or BOLAS. Um, and that's two 12U tethered CubeSats to characterize the lunar hydrogen cycle from both a low and high altitude. So you can see an image of them tethered together there. All right. Um, so that was uh, the, just kind of a small sampling of all the amazing things that are going on in the field of small sats. And I'm just going to take a brief minute to finish up uh, with a reflection on the past and a look forward to the future. So 15 years ago, the CubeSat world was a really different landscape. It wasn't much more than a vision for cheaper and more widespread access to space. So much has happened, in, um, especially in the realm of com commercial companies and universities in the last 15 years. And now NASA and other science organizations are starting to see the value in small sats for science missions. Um, great science is already happening in LEO. I didn't even talk about missions like RainCube and Tempest D. Um, but we've also taken our first steps beyond LEO with MARCO, which is a really exciting time. So this plot predicts that the number of spacecraft is going to, a number of small sats is going to continue to grow exponentially. It's really fueled, uh, fueled by commercial constellations in LEO, but as, you, as you've seen in this talk, there are also a number of small sat missions planned beyond LEO for the near future. So um, lots of uh, launch vehicles now are getting bigger, which means there'll be more opportunities for secondary spacecraft in the future. I could see um, every single mission that NASA launches from now, in, in some point, I would say that they would all carry some sort of secondary payload for, for added science, and you're starting to see that with MARCO. Um, I would say that uh, for future missions, we'll work more co closely with the commercial providers and we'll buy entirely integrated CubeSat platforms rather than NASA or other government organizations trying to make their own. So you'll see those partnerships strengthened. And already, um, we're taking a cue from the commercial world with all of their distributed systems for CubeSats and with missions like Sunrise and the PSDS3 concepts that I was talking about, we'll see the value in distributed networks and constellations for science missions. So with that, I just want to acknowledge some of the people that I chatted with and get their insights from, colleagues that are working in this field and um, were helping me put together some of the information for this talk. I've got a super long list of references. Um, everything in this talk is Googleable. So if, if you want some bedtime reading, feel free to Google the Iris Radio or something like that. Um, and with that, I will take questions. <laughs>